Hi, I'm Peter Prevos, and welcome to the screencast for Chapter 5 of Data Science for Water Utilities. In the previous chapter, we worked out how to calculate descriptive statistics for my water quality data set. But this resulted in a lot of numbers flying around the screen, which is very hard to share with anyone else. A graph is worth more than a thousand numbers. So let's look at visualizing data. Now first, we look at some functions in the base functionality of the R language, and then delve in a bit deeper with the ggplot2 library. Now, first, we will open the visualize.r script, which is 05-visualize.r, and go to the top. Clear out the memory by hitting the broom icon, and yes, and we are good to go. Now, these first lines of code read the data set, and that's what you've seen in the previous chapters. So this is our trusted lab data data set, and I have a turbidity data set as well, which is that the lab data filtered by turbidity. Time series, you've already seen time series in the previous chapters. So I can, for example, take the turbidity date vector and the turbidity result vector. My type is a line chart and I plot this and I get some sort of a time series. Uh, histograms are run with the uh, hist function and the main parameter there is a vector. So here's the vector of all our results. Main is the title. So here's one without log transformation, just not very easy to read, but I can also shove the results into a logarithm function and then I'll get a log transformed plot. The number of breaks in the bar chart are calculated using a formula and you can change that by forcing it with the breaks uh, function. So for example, breaks is five, will show us a chunkier histogram. If I go breaks is 50, then my histogram will, will become very sparse because a lot of values don't exist within this, uh, within this data set. A very useful, another useful way to visualize data, especially distributions and compare them with each other are box and whisker plots. Now let's first evaluate this code without line 33. So we have in line 34, a box plot, which looks like this. Now the box plot function, we need to specify the data set, which is in this case, the stability data frame. I'm taking the log of the result by, and this is the tilde symbol, which you'll find near your escape key, by suburb. LAS equals two means that the X label are uh, rotated by 90 degrees. I have nothing written. Uh, there's no title in that X axis and the title of the graph, the main title is Guam's Utility Samples. But as you see, the B and um, is slightly cut off from the bottom. So we need to change some something in the canvas below and we do that with the PAR function, the paragraph function. And in this case, we set the margins and it goes from the bottom to the left, to the top, to the right. And if I run it now, you see that everything shifted a little bit. To give you an example, if I make this the right side 14, um, I get a graph that looks a bit like this. Now the interesting part of the box plot, let, let's just um, make this a bit more viewable. What we see in the box plot is the box itself, that is the 25th and the 75th percentile. And the thick black line is the median, so the 50th percentile, which in these cases is very close to the 75th or the 25th percentile. Then my whiskers, they are calculated as 1.58 times the interquartile range. So that's what statisticians have worked out is a good size for the whiskers. Any other observation that is either higher than lower than that is an outlier. And of course, if 1.58 times RQR is larger than the maximum, then the whisker is the maximum. Now we can change it with the range, range parameter. So if I set the range as 10 times the RQR, then there are no more outliers. So these are some examples of the base functionality of the R language, plotting functionality. The base plots are very useful for um, 
data exploration but if you want to share visualizations with somebody else and tell stories i highly recommend using the ggplot library which we shall do now so i'm calling the ggplot library and the ggplot library uses or implements the grammar of graphics and the grammar of graphics is a systematic approach to developing data visualizations and it works in layers so we have the first layer which is the data and then we have the aesthetics which is which are which values within data are we going to plot what are we going which value are we going to call the data by for example the geometries this is how we encode the data and either lines or bars or columns or dots and circles and whatever it might be uh, facets are a very useful way of grouping different graphics by uh, creating a grid the statistics which might be a smoothing such as a linear regression line we the next layer then are, uh, are the scales so we might convert the y-axis to logarithm and last but not least we have a theming layer to create the graph that complies with the host style of your journal or publisher or organization so on the left hand side of this graphic here we have and the names of the layers in the GG, uh, in the grammar of graphics methodology and what that roughly looks like in ggplot now what you see here is that there is a plus behind all the functions except for the last one that means that these functions um, the plus sign indicates that a new layer appears so you have a data layer then we have an aesthetics layer we have one geometry but we can add more we then facet it we add some smoothing etc etc so let's implement the grammar of graphics. I've already loaded the ggplot2 library. And if I now type uh, run ggplot2, the ggplot function with lab data as its parameter, I get an empty canvas because that's all I have specified. So let's add some um, aesthetics. And we do that by adding a comma and an AES for aesthetics. And the aesthetics in this case shall be the measure. There's only one, so ggplot will assume that's the x-axis. And what the system has now done, it looks at the measure variable within the lab data data set, then determines that as a qualitative data set and gives us four columns for each of the measures in the data set. But nothing yet is plotted because we have not defined any geometries. I could do the same, for example, where the aesthetics are the date and the result which gives me the canvas for a time series and you see here that uh, our or ggplot rather has scaled both axes and also use specific date formatting all that can be changed in future layers but first let's add some geometries our first example where the aesthetics is the measure and then add a plus and the geometry is the bar chart which is geom underscore bar Within ggplot2, all geometries start with the letters geom and then an underscore. So, for example, if I type geom underscore and go through my order completion, I'll get a very quick look of all the different geometries that are available. Far too many to explain in this uh, screencast. The ggplot website has excellent documentation. So let's go back to our bar. If I run this, the geom bar function will now count how many times each of those measures appears and create a bar chart. Well, this bar chart has no color because we have not instructed ggplot to use any colors. Colors should only be used to visualize data. So if it represents something in the data or if it's part of your house style, otherwise graphs should just be grayscale. Now we can add some color by filling the bars so this is a parameter within geom bar and in this case i use the hex code for purple and if you want to know more about hex codes um, you can read more about that in the book or um, some links on the website in the same way we can create line charts but i'm adding another aesthetic in this particular example which is the color. So I'm plotting the turbidity. 
and my aesthetics are the date and the result. So that's a time series. But I want each line to be colored by suburb and then put that in geom line. So the result will be a very ugly graph that should not be used in, in real life, but this is an example of how not to do it. But what ggplot has done, it assigned a, a color to each suburb, exactly as I instructed it, and drew the lines all on top of each other. Now this is not a good visualization, and although I see a lot of those in my professional life, uh, try and uh, refrain from adding too many lines to one line chart. We'll have a solution for this a bit later on. The colors that ggplot assigns are the basic palette. But of course, we can also change that and assign the colors as we want. And there are various different types of palettes. We have qualitative palettes, there's diverging palettes, and there are scale palettes as well. So let's go back to our bar chart here. And if I know what we see here that I'm, say, I'm saying I'm plotting the lab data, my aesthetics are the suburbs, so I'm counting the number of suburbs, and I'm filling it by measure. So now our bar chart is a stack bar chart where we see the number of samples taken in each suburb and then colored by the measure. But the basic um, palette in the ggplot package is bad ugly and my theory is that it's designed that way to make you think about changing it. How do you change it? So in this case we say fill equals measure so we need to scale the fill and in this case, I'm using the Brewer palette. Now, this is a predetermined palette. There are some more predetermined palettes. In this case, we use a qualitative scale. And the palette that we shall use is set 2, which gives us this pretty visualization. We can also, for example, use set 1, and we get different colors. So these are predetermined. If you want to know what's in Color Brewer, you can go to the Color Brewer website or use this function here in line 79. We can also manually define these colors. So I'm ggplotting the lab data. My aesthetics are the suburb and the fill is measured just like before. But instead of scale fill brewer, I use scale fill manual. And then the values parameter defines my colors, which are shown here. So let's go back to the uh, to the ugly graph we had before, where we colored all these lines by suburb. Now one way of changing this is by using facets. Now what a facet is, is that each of the suburbs in this case will get its own little graph. So we add another layer with a plus. I'm saying facet underscore wrap. Uh, it's one way of having facets where it is wrapped around the canvas you'll and we'll let's run this to see what it looks like so now ggplot works out what is the best distribution of graphs and each suburb now gets its own little graph but we can lower we can increase the data to pixel ratio here by actually removing the colors because they are no longer needed we don't need to communicate the suburb by color because it's written in the ribbon on top so here's a nice way to visualize that type of data having one line on a graph usually doesn't tell a story because it, it requires the reader to, to to view it and to assess it but we can add additional layers to really tell a story with the data that is immediate where an immediate conclusion can be drawn so let's create a separate data set for the trihalomethanes, so THM. We group that by date, and then for each date, we pick the highest value over all the suburbs. So this gives us a very simple table slash data frame that looks like this. We have a date, and we have the maximum THM for that specific date. Let's take that and put that into the ggplot function. My aesthetics are the date and that maximum value. Um, let's comment this out for a second. And if I run these, and I see I run it without the plus, uh, the terminating plus there on geom line. If I run this, I get a graph like this. 
what I can do now is adding a smoother and in this case the method for the smoothing is a linear model by default it uses a low s and there's also other models available which you can find in the help file so if I run these three lines I'm now also getting a linear regression which is pretty flat with the gray ribbon in the background are my 5% and 95% confidence intervals but what I also want to add to this graph to add some context is the limit of 0.25 milligrams per liter for THMs. So now we're telling a story is that there is not an increasing trend, but we had five exceedances for THM within the GOMSI system. So now you see how we can combine these layers to start telling a story in the data. The next layer or the second last layer are the coordinates. So let's use the geom box plot which you see here now the problem here with this box plot is that because there are so many outliers they are quite squashed so that it's not become doesn't become very visible so we could use this k y log 10 transformation um, give it a name and also add the number of breaks to add a logarithmic uh, transformation and what you can also do, just there are some more coordinate transformations you can do. Uh, for example, we can flip the whole thing by 90 degrees to create a slightly easier to read graph. So coordinates. Now the last layer are the themes. So far, we have only concerned ourselves with visualizing the data in the best way and telling a story. But we might want to add some theming because uh, we might have a house style uh, to comply with for example now here's an example um, where I am plotting the turbidity data for each suburb I'm using the facet rep and n call equals one means there's only one column so it forces it to put them all right on top uh, below each other but I don't like any of the uh, theming elements so I can use um, comment this one out for a second I can use the theme void which you see here and theme void takes away all the background elements there are lots of other themes available I can use theme minimal for example which is my favorite which gives a bit of a minimalistic view um, an important parameter is the base size I can then increase all the fonts if that's what I want to do but this is a bit crazy so let's go to 12 lots of other themes are available the way to find them again is type theme underscore and let your fingers do the walking by going through the autocomplete so let's use theme light for example and remove this one and this is theme light there are also specialized packages that create their own themes uh, for example theming for specific journals and so on and you can also create your own theme within my uh, professional work I have a theme created for my employer and the way to do that is with the theme function there are a lot of different options available but here's an example on how to turn the element text so that's the text on the y-axis by 45 degrees so let's put all this together and tell a data story. I'm creating a small data set here, which I call limits. And the limits data set has the measure and the limit. So there's two limits for chlorine, one for THM and one for turbidity. And in my ggplot function, you see here, it's quite a complicated function that goes over more than 10 lines. I'm filtering what I'm doing here is I'm filtering the data set so I'm just putting that straight into the ggplot function my statics are the date and the result so in other words it's a time series but before we add the time series I'm adding a horizontal line not with the lab data that we put into the ggplot function but with the limits data with its own aesthetics and because it's the h line the aesthetics has to be a y intercept and my intercept is the limit uh, it's a red line a line type 2 which is a dotted a dashed line 
So running this gives me these four lines. I then put the actual line itself on there, but I need to facet this to, to make it readable. Now I'm using the facet grid. So in the facet grid, I can say what is on the Y axis of the grid and the X axis. So I'm saying that plotting the measures by suburb. So here's that tilde symbol again that we saw earlier. And I'm using scales equals three Y so that each um, measure gets its own scaling. If I don't use this, ggplot will use a single scaling for everything. So that becomes less readable, right? Because uh, Tibidity has a much broader range than uh, chlorine, for example. Then I'm fixing the dates with the scale X dates uh, function and how to use these, this labeling is explained in working with dates chapter. I'm changing the theme and I'm adding some labels, a title, a subtitle and a caption. And that gives me a complete story that I might want to share with my colleagues. Anyone looking at this can immediately work out whether there are any problems in Blankethe, Merton or Tarnstadt for those three parameters. How do you share this? The ggsave function allows you to save a graphic and it is always the one that is currently shown on the screen. The first parameter is the file name and in this case I'm saving it to PDF with 297 and by 210 millimeters. By default, the units are inches, but I've changed it here to make it a nice A4. Saving that to disk, which now should appear on my files. There we go, Gormsey Lab Data. And we can view this, and this now can be shared with anyone who might be interested in the data. If you'd like to learn, uh, learn more about this, then feel free to uh, read my book, Data Science Water Utilities or contact me if you have any questions or comments about this screencast, my website, um, or the book. In the next chapter, we're going to look at using our markdown to share the results of analysis through a PowerPoint presentation.